You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Bitcoin, Ether, Solana, Doge, and more. Cryptocurrencies and digital assets are taking the financial world by storm. This exploding market provides everything a savvy trader needs. Volatility, volume, and liquidity, provided you know how to find it. That's where we come in. Welcome to the Crypto Rundown. Each week, we'll break down the latest trading activity, trends, and developments throughout the world's leading crypto derivatives markets. If it's moving the crypto markets, then you'll find it on The Crypto Rundown. The Crypto Rundown is brought to you by Amber Data. If you're entering the digital asset class, you'll need access to granular on-chain and market data from multiple venues to power research, trading, risk management, and compliance. Amber Data delivers comprehensive data and insights into blockchain networks, crypto markets, and decentralized finance, empowering financial institutions to apply traditional finance methods to digital assets. Amber Data eliminates the infrastructure setup, integration challenges, and maintenance headaches to access digital asset data, reducing cost and time to market to enter the digital asset class. Learn more and download their digital asset data guide at www.amberdata.io. Now it's time to dive into the exploding world of crypto derivatives. It's time for The Crypto Rundown. All right, everybody. That music means we are back once again with the Crypto Rundown, the program here on the network where we go beyond our traditional stopping grounds of Tesla and Apple and Spy and VIX options. Look a little bit farther afield and see what's going on out there in the world of crypto derivatives. going to talk what's going on in the spot, but also the options, the volume, the volatility, the skew, the all that fun and a whole bunch more. My name, of course, Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as from the ever scintillating, at least we tend to think so, Options Insider Radio Network. Reminding you of three things. First off, if you do like what you hear, do keep rating and reviewing. Obviously, the network's been around for quite some time. This January was 16 years, so this show not quite as long, but still a decent trajectory for this show as well. So we have a decent backlog of people who've been checking it out, but we always appreciate new ones. It does help new people continue to discover the program out there. And of course, if you're not listening to the full network, if you're just listening to the Crypto Rundown, you're missing out on all that other fun, nearly a dozen programs at your fingertips 24-7 out there. And of course, you want even more content in your lives. And hey, who can blame you? Theoptionsinsider.com slash pro is the place to go to engage with all that, including a lot of great crypto oriented guests coming into our pro q a sessions over there you can learn more about all that fun the options insider.com slash pro as we go on into our first segment it is time for the crypto hot seat forget about cold storage it's time to turn up the heat on thought leaders from the world of cryptocurrencies and digital assets it's time to take their place on the, the crypto, crypto hot, hot seat, seat. All right, everybody, welcome to the Crypto Hot Seat, the portion of the program where we welcome on guests from throughout the world of crypto derivatives and indeed beyond and proceed to pick their brains for the benefit of you, the listener. And next up is a newcomer to the program and indeed to the network. He is Stuart Pope Joy, the co-founder of Kadena. Stuart, welcome to the Crypto Rundown program. Thanks. Uh, it's great to be here. And Stuart, as we are wont to do with all of our first timers here on the show, why don't you go ahead and give our audience a bit of an overview of your background in the financial and indeed crypto markets, as well as what it is you folks do over there at Kadena. 
Sure. So uh, I'm Stuart Popetra. I'm the founder and CEO of Cadena. Uh, we offer the leading, most scalable uh, layer one blockchain solution and safest, most secure smart contract language, Pact. Uh, we launched in 2019 and we've been running ever since, offering uh, an alternative for people who want to have a industrial strength, uh, not just uh, not just for execution, but also for settlement. And uh, we founded in 2016, we came out of the JP Morgan blockchain group at the time. That was the group that would introduce JPM coin. And our technology was used for the first uh, invocation of JPM coin. Uh, I myself uh, am a technologist. Uh, I've been in this for way too long. I've been in uh, uh, technology since the 90s. My first job was at Apple Computer in 1992. Uh, around 2000 is when I got involved in financial technology, uh, mainly exchange tech and trading tech uh, in New York City, and uh, was doing various things there before I ended up at JP Morgan, uh, building their uh, industrial uh, equity uh, algorithmic trading platform before transitioning into blockchain at JP Morgan uh, in around 2014. And then eventually spinning out to form Cadena originally as a private blockchain or enterprise blockchain project. But uh, we fairly quickly pivoted to launching our scalable proof of work public blockchain. And, uh, and now it, we're expanding into having our smart contract language uh, access other platforms as well, including Ethereum, as well as uh, moving into the realm of just web technology in general. Uh, with the idea that um, in crypto, we've learned how to do things uh, more safely than a lot of other platforms. And there's no reason why web technology shouldn't be benefit from that as well. I want to dive into all that. Before we look forward, I want to look back a little bit here, Stuart. Uh, you mentioned JPM coin. That was all the rage a few years back. Your technology was obviously used to drive that. So let's start there. You know, JPM coin launched with the bang. Everyone was really excited. A lot of people saw it as the first institutional real foray into this space. It was coming hot on the heels of a lot of other big developments. Crypto was running up into stratospheric valuations. It seemed like maybe this was crypto's leap into prime time. It launched with a bang. It kind of ended, not it didn't really end, but it's kind of drifted on with more of a whimper. I'm curious, what were your thoughts on that whole process? The incredible amount of hype <laughs> whether JPM coin ever lived up to that hype and maybe some lessons you folks learned over there at Kadena for that whole process that you're applying now to your new startup here. Well, I mean, the first lesson we learned was we, act, we acted on pretty quickly, which is that we uh, shifted from an enterprise blockchain focus, which JPM coin is an enterprise blockchain project. It's not something that runs on any of the public crypto networks. Um, to launching a public blockchain, you know, similar to Ethereum or Solana or anything like that. Um, and the reason being is that we, I think we saw the writing on the wall sooner than some uh, in the sense that uh, enterprise blockchain itself was uh, more or less doomed because it was, it was basically almost hostile to what was going on in crypto. And it was clear to us that the real innovation was going on in crypto. Um, and that a lot of what was going on with the big companies was kind of a typical innovation cycle where they kind of test drive a new, uh, you know, they test drive some new technology. And since they're big companies, of course, a lot of people want to get involved. JPM, of course, did leg in quite a bit themselves uh, with JPM coin and were very tech forward about it, which is not really characteristic of JP Morgan. So it was, it was really something to see and it was exciting to be there at the beginning of it. But that's even one of the reasons why we, spun out of JP Morgan is that we felt like the right focus wasn't there. Um, and uh, a lot of what they were doing with JPM coin, I think in the end was trying to uh, figure out some, you know, any kind of use case that might make sense using private blockchain technology. And so it's kind of gone the way of all the other private or enterprise blockchain use cases, which is not very far. I can't imagine why you thought JP Morgan wasn't the best place. Was it the 8 million comments Jamie Dimon made about how, you know, Bitcoin was a scam <laughs> and, rip off and everything else? <laughs> That's what made JPM well, coin so interesting, right? Was the complete about face that it represented. Sure. Right. And we were and, and I was, you know, I started the group that launched it. And it's the thing is, is that, it, you know, big companies are like this where you'll have, you know, maybe the leadership is saying one thing. But then, of course, you've got 
tech groups and innovation groups looking at something else. So to a certain extent, there's nothing really unusual about that. One thing I like to point out with Jamie Dimon's very colorful comments about Bitcoin is that, you know what Jamie Dimon can't make colorful comments about? Docs. He is restricted <laughs> as a principal of a broker dealer, amongst other things, company to not make, you know, weird, random, perhaps uninformed opinions about Apple, about MSFT, right? But he can about Bitcoin. Yeah, so. he certainly wasn't reticent about throwing some shade. Well, just think what that means, because like there was nothing prohibiting JP Morgan from being involved in Bitcoin derivatives or anything like that. And then he's going out and saying things. So... I liked, you your, I liked your comment there about uh, enterprise blockchain and just blockchain, maybe early iterations in general, kind of being hostile to what was going on in the crypto space. There's been some interesting, I wouldn't call it blowback, but some interesting, I think, discussion in the financial space in regard to uh, the early days of blockchain. And, you know, it kind of coincided with the rise of crypto, the launch of the first crypto futures out there. And a lot of everyone was Super excited back in those heady days of 2016 to 2017. This was the future. Blockchain was the future. Bitcoin was going to ride that wave of blockchain, but really the hype was for blockchain. Blockchain this, blockchain that. Everyone and their mother was spinning up arms to invest in blockchain. It seemed like there was an endless amount of hype, bottomless amount of hype. And it does seem over the last, especially in the last year, I just came back from a big derivatives industry conference uh, last week as well. It does seem like there's a lot of people starting to look back at that now and saying maybe blockchain hasn't really lived up to the hype, especially in this context, in the financial markets context. I'm curious for you, Stuart, you've been in the trenches of blockchain longer than most. Where do you feel the blockchain stacks up now? Has it delivered on the promise yet? Or are we still in the early infancy stages here? <laughs> well, a lot of people like to, you know, it's, it's almost a it's almost a cliche now in blockchain supporters to say it's still early. Um, they're right and they're wrong. Um, they're, uh, they're wrong in the sense that it's actually not that early. Bitcoin launched in 2009. So, you know, we're, we've been doing this for a little while now. And, you know, when you look at other tech uh, kind of innovations that have happened in the past 30 years, like it didn't take mobile this long to get, you know, like once, once the right product hit the market, it didn't take that long, right? Um, it's, it's not early in some respects. So I do think that like crypto boosters have to answer some hard questions about like, why has it not achieved its promise that everyone was so, you know, breathless to promote in circa 2017, circa 2018. Um, having said that though, I think that, uh, it, it, some of it has to do with the fact that I think crypto is still figuring out. Uh, is still kind of overcoming some of the limitations of how things were kind of initially rolled out. I mean, look no further than Ethereum, which today is still kind of facing, they're not existential questions, but they're really central questions to how are we ever going to get out from under this platform that's really expensive to compute on. And the, and the current answer is to use layer two technology, which is the right answer. Um, and it's one that we're moving heavily into as well. So, you know, we believe in the promise of layer two as well at, although we also believe in the promise of having a scalable layer one. But um, you know, I think it's this, uh, the fact of the matter is that crypto has really leveraged its position as being an alternative asset. And, you know, so when you talk about 2017 to 2018, well, what was really going on was all the ICOs and the ICO craze. And of course, that's when we raised our, you know, most of our initial capital to launch our public blockchain. So, uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not here to say that that was a bad thing. However, I will say that a lot of claims are being made that would lead people to spend a lot of money or invest a lot of money in this blockchain platform or that. Um, and those ICOs went spectacularly well. You know, I mean, the amount of money that got raised for startups in that period it was astonishing. So, um, you know, so to a certain extent, this is probably kind of like 2000 was for Web2 technology in the sense that a correction was inevitable. Um, I do actually think that it's do that the that the most recent crypto winner is is actually refocusing crypto on realizing its promise as something that can actually change how people work with finance as opposed to uh, provide uh, an alternative asset for people to speculate on. And indeed, that's what I'm most excited about is the idea that we can actually um, change the way people's almost change the way people uh, are able to access 
not just uh, assets, but also uh, internet technology itself. I think decentralization is extremely powerful. I think the idea that you can, uh, you know, it, it, it extends all the way to things like controlling your own data and, you know, concerns that are not strictly financial. Um, so long answer, but I think, uh, you know, I think the correction is overdue. Also, the other thing to remember is that there was a brief crypto winner, you know, after 2018. So some, even some of those initial kind of breathless, uh, you know, like what happened, the second wave was DeFi. And one thing, especially if you have a financial background like this show does, I mean, one thing you have to admit is that decentra- DeFi exchanges like Uniswap are interesting beasts and they're things that didn't really exist before. So when people say, oh, crypto hasn't really done anything new, it's like, have you really looked at a constant product exchange? Because they're pretty interesting. And I know because I used to build exchanges. <laughs> this, is not some, this is not an order book exchange. This is something different. You're right. So I, I've lost track of how many crypto winters we've gone through just since 2017, 2018. <laughs> there, there's many different definitions, many different evolutions we've seen out there in the space. But you hit on something that has been a, a big sticking point for a lot of people, particularly in the financial space. Uh, which is scalability that when people come back and they hit on blockchain, they say it's never going to be ready for prime time for the real U.S. financial markets. They hit on that one fact, scalability, scalability, blockchain just can't handle the number of transactions that are demanded by, let's say, a large stock exchange, let alone an options exchange with quotes flying fast and furious in milliseconds out there. You mentioned improving that with the different layers out there, but I'm curious for you and from your perspective, for people who are pushing back now in the financial world and say, you know, blockchains, it's never going to be there. It's never going to be ready for prime time to really deliver on the scalability that the financial markets need. What do you say to those folks, Stuart? Well, I think it's interesting because, like, you know, they, they come with this particular criticism. But, you know, there's also, I think, within crypto, there's some misconceptions as well. And one of the things that we've always... So when we launched in 2000, when Cadena launched in 2016, one of the things we really wanted to do was bring kind of like cutting edge engineering from fintech and specifically from trading tech and make it, you know, and make it available in the world of blockchain. And that meant that scalability was one of our first concerns. Um, we had the most scalable private blockchain at the time by, by leaps and bounds. And scalability meant something a little different in enterprise blockchain. So that's not really going to be appropriate for what we're talking about now. But um but uh, in the case of public blockchain, you know, the, the, the situation has been that um, the focus in terms of like what a lot of the people have been working on and even the move from proof of work to proof of stake was one on this idea that you could get blockchain to have this kind of instantaneous, you know, layer one blockchain to have this kind of quick settlement feel and that like eventually would be able to host like, you know, all the transactions in the world or something like that. It's not exactly how we look at things for our layer one. Our layer one we made it horizontally scalable. We were not interested in making it have fast finality because we felt what if you want Bitcoin, let's just look at Bitcoin. Bitcoin is definitely slow, right? If you want to like buy something with Bitcoin, you know, that you can work with networks that will clear it faster. But the fundamental fact is it's going to take an hour for that thing to clear. That's just the way it is. And on Ethereum, it's going to take something in the order of minutes. Um, that sounds slow. You know, it's not something, you know, like if you're, if you're at the checkout lane or something like that, it was certainly if you're trading, that's just ridiculous. However, what you really need to contrast that with is the fact that you're actually settling that transaction. If you want to talk about settlement, Bitcoin is faster than Visa. Bitcoin is faster than the U.S. stock market. You know, assuming that uh, there are other aspects of scalability, too. I mean, Bitcoin gets clogged and then it really can't handle anything. But that's kind of the point of the Cadena blockchain is that if you can just horizontally scale that concept, then you can get to a settlement platform that will be the best settlement platform in the world. And indeed, with our technology, which actually scales multiple chains to run as a single chain, um, it means that we can already settle the U.S. stock market on our chain. But I say that because I know what really happens at the end of the day. What really happens at the end of the day is after all the allocations, all you're dealing with is actually market participants. That's many orders of magnitude less than the actual trading that goes on in the U.S. stock market. So Canada can definitely handle that today. Um, the US stock, I'm not going to say that the U.S. stock market is banging down our door to settle on our blockchain. Um, and you know, I'm not even sure that's the right use case. But the point being is that... Um, 
settlement has actually been kind of downplayed in crypto. And that's what's starting to change with this layer two is that people are starting to see, oh, what, right, we don't actually want to run things on Ethereum and we want to settle things to Ethereum. And so we're actually finding ourselves being very well positioned to move into this new discussion. Um, so, you know, so that's where I think uh, crypto, this is another example. It's not that crypto is young. It's that I think it's trying out different ideas. And the idea that a layer one platform will actually give you, uh, you know, a great experience for like having, uh, you know, for speculating and trading on stocks or trading on assets. No, I don't think that's what a layer one is for. But, you know, could a pl- could a scaled platform on top of a scalable settlement layer give you good experience for that? Definitely. That's a good point about refocusing and reframing the conversation away from some of the millisecond transaction speed and into the, the settlement, which you're right, can be done on a little bit more crypto, more blockchain friendly process. But you also made a good point about people beating down your door over the last six months or perhaps not so much. I'm, I'm curious. We've had a lot of guests coming in from the institutional side of the crypto space over the last six months and giving some interesting viewpoints on what they're hearing from an institutional demand, whether it be on the trading side and or interest in crypto. We, of course, saw a bit of a nadir in anything in this space back in November of last year, post FTX. A lot of firms were stepping back, at least for the moment, kind of washing their hands of the space, saying, look, we always said it was the Wild West, and and this proves it. Of course, so far in 2023, we've seen a nice little run-up in the crypto market, so that seems to have reignited some firms' interest out there in this space. I'm curious, from your perspective, Stuart, over the past six months, and particularly into the early part of this year, but what has been your perspective? What are you hearing from the institutional firms? Are they excited about blockchain? Are they beating a path to your door again? Or has it been a little bit quiet post FTX and it's still waiting to recuperate? Well, you know, interestingly enough, because we, we actually follow the trend into DeFi and stuff like that, a lot of our focus has actually been more on the crypto community. We, we, we didn't really focus on institutional uh, so much once we made the pivot to public. But uh, having said that, uh, I think, you know, the, the thing that always ends up, you know, the discussion that always has to be had is what's going on in the macro environment. And, you know, has things have things really changed in terms of like do people have anywhere they can really put their money? You know, you still have the, you, you still have a bunch of trap capital all around the world, um, and that that's what really created the whole, whole situation with crypto is that you have a bunch of people wanting to put their money into something, and you know, at the end of the day, Bitcoin isn't the worst thing to put it into. I mean, just, if you you know if you're putting it into all sorts of weird real estate here and there, and you're you know, it's let's face it, it's it's still. A crazy investing environment. <laughs> How crazy is what you just said? But it's actually true. We were debating this on the network just last week. The resurgence of Bitcoin and ETH. It's almost like crypto has become a flight to quality asset steward. Did you ever think you would be in this space long enough to hear those words? <laughs> I mean, I actually think Bitcoin is a quality asset. But what can I say? I'm biased. I really love crypto. You know, um, and I really one of the things in Cadena is that we really wanted to build on the shoulder of those giants in particular, in the sense that. We feel like Bitcoin introduced something genuinely new to the world. And let's face it, it's, there, you know, it's interesting because it, around that time period you were talking around 2017 and 2018, you know what people didn't think? They didn't think that Bitcoin was going to be the be all end all like it is. And I'm not saying it's the be all end all, but it, they didn't think that it was going to remain as this like unshakable blue chip within crypto. Um, in fact, what a lot of people thought was going to happen was that um, you know, one of these like Bitcoin cash kinds of things, or even like people taking the Bitcoin ledger onto a better, you know, so-called better technology, like onto a faster technology, onto a fast settlement technology. Like maybe that's what was going to happen is that people just take that whole ledger and bridge it over to another platform. And then that's where Bitcoin's really going to live. Well, none of that came true, right? It turned out that it, people would like to say it's the ledger, not the technology. Well, it actually turns out it's both. It's the fact it's Bitcoin is kind of, you know, it's it's its own thing. And you can't really separate the network from the asset. So, um, so I'm not totally surprised just because, you know, like that, that was one of the reasons why we went the way we did is because, you know, the, the two coins that were really dominating were the ones that were based on the most conservative technology. And, and at that time, it was proof of work. Now, Ethereum has transitioned to proof of stake and uh, successfully, which was, you know, extremely impressive and, you know, way smoother than anybody thought it would be. Um, uh, but interestingly enough, that didn't that didn't even put a dent in their scalability problems. 
Um, and, and if anything, it might be making them, you know, who knows what it'll do. The fact that it used to be a proof of work coin and now it's a proof of stake coin. I mean, the implications of that, you know, are going many directions. Um, but, uh, so I'm, yeah, I'm not totally surprised. Um, I think that crypto is more, a more fundamental innovation than a lot of people, you know, a lot of people, I think the fact that you can't tell if it's a, 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 a currency or a commodity or store of value, I think that's part of what makes it interesting is that, you know, it isn't something you dig out of the ground. It isn't something that you trade on an FX exchange. It's something different. It sounds like the SEC is still weighing a lot of those decisions themselves there, Stuart. I'm curious for you and the team, Kadena, as we come into this new year now, we're seeing crypto rallying, but also maybe hearing some disconcerting comments out of the SEC. Are you a little bit concerned about the outlook going forward for where crypto will stand in, let's say, a year or two? Well, I, I think the thing that's most troubling is just the lack of guidance, you know, that um, is the whole kind of like guidance via enforcement that's been going on. Um, I mean, I think that the SEC is in a bit of a tight spot on some of these things in the sense that, um, you know, ined- inevitably people, you know, like crypto can't have it both ways. You can't like, you can't yell at the SEC for regulating stuff. And then when FTX blow up, blows up, say, wait, where is the SEC? Why didn't they protect us from FTX? It's like, wait, it's, <laughs> it's one of the other guys. You either have to be pro-regulation and want everything to be regulated, or you have to accept that something like FDX is the inevitable outcome of not having regulation and letting people just speculate into the moon. So, um, so I don't, you know, I, I have actually some sympathy for what the SEC is trying to do, which, you know, let's remember what the SEC does for the stock market is that it, it seeks to protect uh, investors and not just big investors, but small investors. And that's very important for the stock market because if the stock market stopped appealing to retail investors, there would be no stock market because there'd be no money to be made. They have a very important job, which is to make the stock market not seem like the Wild West so that you know, retail and you know, non-institutional traders will continue to you know, put money into it. And so it's the same thing with crypto that if you want crypto to leave the realm of speculation and leave the realm of like, you know, bullish traders, you know, trying to like, you know, manipulate prices and all this kind of stuff. That means you need something like the SEC to come in and provide some kind of regulation. I don't know what the answer is to that. I just don't think it's as simple as a lot of people are making it out to be. Well, Stuart, I appreciate you taking some time to join us here on the crypto hot seat. We have to keep rolling on with the program. But before we do that, we like to leave our audience wanting a little bit more. So before we roll out of this segment, if you'd like to leave them with any hints, any teases of what they can look forward to coming down the pike from you and the team over there at Kadena, now is the time, sir. The floor is yours. Well, the main thing is just that we're really excited about all this focus on layer two tech that's happening with the Ethereum network. And we're going to be we're definitely looking to get involved in that particular technology stack to augment what's going on with our great layer one technology. It's basically all about our smart contract language pack. Um, and it's always been the safest smart contract language and also the easiest to learn. Um, it's something that was designed with like industrial financial engineering in mind, but to be accessible to even, uh, you know, non-programmers, non-programmers can write smart contracts in fact. So expect to see a lot from Cadena as 2023 goes forward, as we move into some new arenas so we can really show the world what PACT is capable of. Well, we'll look forward to seeing all that play out there in the marketplace. And Stuart, if folks want to check all this out for themselves, where should they go? What should they do? Uh, you can find us all in all the usual places. There's our uh, uh, there's our Twitter handle, which is Kadena underscore IO. There's also our website, Kadena dot IO. And then we're also in the usual places on Discord and Telegram where our community is there and they'd love to talk to you. So lots of ways to find out more. We're also rolling out for builders. We're rolling out lots of new uh, development platform and docs websites. So there's never been more, there's never been more ways to check out what Cadena is uh, giving the public so they can build the future. There you go. Check them out over there at Cadena underscore IO on Twitter as we keep on rolling right on into the Bitcoin breakdown. It's time to explore the latest trending activity, trends and developments across the world's leading crypto market. It's time for the Bitcoin breakdown. All right, everyone, welcome to the Bitcoin Breakdown, the portion of the show where we do just that. We break down all the action in the world's leading digital asset. Yup, the big dog, which is Bitcoin, looking a little bit bigger 
than it has been, but uh, not quite at the apex. <laughs> On our last show, we were at about just a little bit north, just a, just a tick north of 28,000. 28,008, to be precise. Coming into the start of the show today, 27,127. So giving up around 881 handles on the week. In terms of range, it was actually a fairly tight range for all things Bitcoin. <laughs> What's interesting about it is that we, we experienced it all. We lived the full range over the breadth of one session. It was last Wednesday. So a couple of days after our show, we hit the low for the week of 26,736, as well as the high of 28,708. So we did a lot of living over the span of 24 hours before settling back down into this range where we're hanging out right now, a little bit north of 27,000. What does that mean if we're hanging out at these levels? Listen, it means vol is probably going to come in a little bit, and that's pretty much what we saw. Not a ton. Last week, the vol 65. This week, the vol is 60. By the way, if you want to see these analytics and everything else we're going to talk about on the show today and a whole bunch that we don't have time to get on the show, it is only a one-hour show pretty much at the end of the day, listeners. Head on over to Amber Data, A-M-B-E-R Data dot I-O. That's the place to go to kick the tires and light the fires on all this data and a whole bunch more listeners. You'd see that we're hanging out at about a 60 in the at the money vol out there in Bitcoin. That's down about five points. Last week, we were at about a 65. Still frothy, still far more volatile than, let's say, equities, which are hanging out in the low 20s right around now. And even a lot of the commodities we talk about on shows like This Week in Futures Options, which, by the way, you should be checking out if you're listening to this show, listeners. We see most of the commodities we're going to discuss there are usually somewhere in the mid-20s up to about 30, with the exceptions being, let's say, Nat Gas and a few others that are somewhere around triple digits. But most of them tend to be in that mid-20s to low-30s range. So a 60 vol is still extremely volatile compared to a lot of the other assets we discuss on this network. Skew-wise, we saw last week the skew had shifted to pretty firmly positive, about five points premium to the calls. This week, that's gone away. It's all flat now. So the market, once again, kind of scratching its chin and saying, hmm, where are we heading next? The option's not really showing us any strong indication in one direction or the other. That's also reflected in the OI. It's up, but only up slightly on the week. Last week, coming into showtime, there were about 268,000 Calls open on Darabit. It's up about 8,000 from this time last week. Puts 142,000 up about 7,000. So we still are inside that two to one level. So that's intriguing in and of itself. Usually a Bitcoin hangs out at around, let's say, two and a half to one, maybe sometimes getting to three to one calls over puts when things get really excitable out there. Not quite at that level. Inside two to one. So that makes it Perhaps a little bit more interesting. Let's see what's going on out there in the top positions. What's open for size out there in Bitcoin options right now? Let's find out with a quick top five. Number five, it is the 27,000 strike listener that has 18,100 contracts open. That's up about 900 from this time last week. So I said we kissed all those different levels. But that's where we're hanging out right now, the 27,000 level. So not surprising that would be in our top five this week. Number four, we have the 40,000 strike, 19,000 contracts exactly. That's a newcomer to our top five. Right behind it, we have the 32,000 strike, so still very optimistic. Coming in at number three, it's got 19,800 contracts open. Also a newcomer to the top five. So is it a coincidence that we were flirting with some interesting levels this week and all of a sudden the 32,000 and the 40,000 strike making their way into our top five? I think not. Number two, we have the 25,000 strike listeners. 23,500 contracts are open there. That's actually down about 1,100 on the week. And the number one size position in Bitcoin options yet again this week, the 30K strike has got 24,000 contracts open. It's up about a couple of hundred. Not a huge evolution there, but interesting to see more of these, shall we say, optimistic strikes making it into our top five this week. <laughs> so a lot to unpack as we keep on rolling out there into your favorite way to get some Bitcoin access in your securities account. Yep, we're talking about Bitto, unless you're our friend Mr. Bill has been on the show many times. He prefers of the grayscale trusts out there. A lot of you like Bitto. No shortage of you liking it because it is optionable out there. 1660 when we kicked off the show. I puts it down about two-thirds of a point from where it was this time last week. ADVY is still looking frothy. 91,000 contracts is the ADV. Now, that's up 9,000 from this time last week. So Bitto, a pretty active options contract, all things considered. In fact, Today, as we kicked off the show, we saw exactly 91,000 contracts on the tape as well. So they had just hit their ADV when we kicked off the show. Uh, the vol hanging out pretty much at about a 65, down about one point. So a little bit more elevated than the options over there on Darabit. But 
in that same ballpark, the mid 60s there. In terms of action, what's open for size out here in Bitto options? Let's do a quick top five out here as well. Number five, we have 19,000 of the Jan 18 calls. Number four, 20,000 of the Jan 25s. Number three, 25,000 of the June 8 puts. So those are still hanging out there, but getting bumped a little bit further down the list this week. Number two, 26,000 of the Jan 24 puts. And then remember, I've said it before, listeners. People really have fascination with the 10 strike in Bitto options, in particular, the 10 puts. And that appears to be the case again, listeners, because the new number one size position, listeners, just building, (laughs) building upon size. We have the April 10 puts 86,000 of these bad boys open. Looks like they've gone up in a lot of big blocks. We saw 14,000 more go up just earlier this week. We saw 52,000 of these trading on the 13th and then another about 14,000 going up on the 15th. So this has been a very popular trade. Looks like they were selling them in big blocks, especially on the 13th. Prices around 24, 26, 22 cents, somewhere in that range, in that 25 cent ballpark. So a lot of folks trying to harvest some of the old risk premium. That's a popular trade. A lot of people have used that line of demarcation 10 they don't mind picking up some bit if it drops below that. Are you part of this this explosion of paper on the 10 strike? Listen, do you like just selling that 10 strike straight up for around 25 cents? Would you prefer to maybe do a little bit of the old one by two, buy a higher up put and then sell on a ratio, maybe two of the April 10 puts and trying to take advantage of what you perceive to be maybe a bit of a downturn coming here in Bitcoin? Either way, intriguing and also interesting to see that 10 strike after dominating the tape for a long time in Bitto. Kind of went away, got kicked to the curb by things like these June 8 puts. Now we're seeing the 10 puts coming back in. I was, I was waiting for that moment. It looks like the last couple of weeks we finally see it come to pass as we keep on rolling and explore beyond Bitcoin into the altcoin universe. It's time to move beyond Bitcoin and find out what's moving the rest of the crypto marketplace. It's time to boldly venture into the altcoin universe. All right, everybody, welcome to the Altcoin Universe, the portion of the show where we explore everything going on outside of the big dog, which is Bitcoin, except for right now, when we talk about the top 10 from a market cap perspective, kind of hard to leave Bitcoin out of that conversation. Number 10 is Binance USD hanging out at about 7.8 billion. So we're seeing it dip below 8 billion to break into the top 10 in market cap again. Again, Binance USD had some questions around it lately. We'll see how that holds up, but obviously not kicking it out of the top 10 yet. So that's intriguing in and of itself. Number nine, Polygon holding out at about nine and a half billion worth of market cap listeners. Number eight, it's Doge, 9.6 billion. So just eking past Polygon this week. Number seven, it's Cardano, 11.9 billion. Number six, XRP, 24.1 billion. Number five, USD coin, we've got it at about 33.6. Number four, BNB, 48. Point eight billion. Number three, it's Tether, seventy nine billion. Number two, it's ETH, two hundred and nine billion. And the big dog, Bitcoin listeners, five hundred and twenty three billion. So just slightly north of that half a trillion level. In terms of ETH listeners, on our last show, we were hanging out at about a seventeen sixty five. Coming in to start of today's show, seventeen seventeen. So down about forty eight handles or so from where we were this time last week. We got as high as 1840 since our last show that came last Thursday and the low came in this morning earlier today. Listeners at 1708 right before showtime there. So didn't quite break the 1700 level, even though we flirted with it earlier this morning. Vol wise, we haven't really seen a big evolution out there on the ball front in ETH either. 62 and a half last week, 61 and about a quarter this week. So coming in a little over a point, but. Still hanging out at actually a very similar level to Bitcoin, which is kind of interesting. Usually we see ETH structurally more volatile than Bitcoin, so trading at a bit of a vol premium. Right now they're hanging out at about that same level. So that that vol spread has come in, which is intriguing in and of itself. Looking at the skew last week, listeners, you folks were all optimistic, all bullish, all positive on ETH. The skew was nearly five points positive to the calls. This week that has swung in the other direction Not only has it gone back to flat, but back to negative, down almost negative two and a half right now. So nearly a seven point swing in the skew this week, which is fascinating. Maybe showing a little bit of the bloom in the near term coming off the rose, but it's not a huge 
negative bias. Not like we're seeing negative 30 or anything like that. So just slightly negative, maybe just enough to say maybe this near term run was a little bit too, uh, too much of a good thing. Dialing it back a little bit in terms of expectations over the coming week. And it will make some sense given the price action we've seen out there. In terms of OI, we are seeing a little bit more OI stack up out there on Deribit. Almost 2.8 million, about 2.79 million calls open on Deribit right now. It's up about 30,000 from this time last week. And the puts a little bit north of 1 million, about 1.02 million to be precise, up about 28,000. So no real change out there net from a uh, puts versus calls perspective. Both moving up about the same amount this week. Let's see if there's any interesting changes in our top five in ETH options. Any big shakeups this week? And the answer is pretty much no. It's all the same players just changing their order up a little bit this week, listeners. Number five, we have the 2,000 strikes. So intriguing, too optimistic. I'll leave it up to you to decide, listeners. Coming in at number five, 226,000 contracts open there. That's up 12,000 this week. Number four, we have the 1,600 strike, 234,000 contracts open there. That's up 12,000 as well. That's the magic number this week. Number three, the 1,900 strike, 236,000 contracts open there. That's actually down 15,000. So a lot of closing paper on the 1,900 strike this week. Number two, all the way up to 4,000 listeners. (laughs) That's got 257,000 contracts open. That's up 3,000 this week. And then we have the big dog this week, the 1,800 strike. That's got 282,000 contracts open. That's down 6,000. So an intriguing level. Again, we flirted with it, got briefly north of it on Thursday, uh, but still not enough to kick it out of our top five as we moved away from it. Still holding down the number one spot out there in ETH options this week, listeners. Let's get on out to some of the other products dominating the altcoin universe, and we'll get out of here for this week, listeners. Uh, Solana, back below a 20 handle right now, 1992, when we kicked off the show. An excellent year, maybe not the best price level, uh, for Solana, when it was hanging out at about almost a 2240 this time last week. Remember, we talked for a while here about the resurgence of Solana this week. Caught a lot of people by surprise. I should say the resurgence of Solana this year. Caught a lot of people by surprise out there, especially when it was languishing below 10 bucks in the wake of the whole FTX debacle. Solana obviously very closely linked with a lot of what was going on over there. Some people thought it would never get past it. We actually... Stop talking about Solana options here on the show. This resurgence has been interesting to watch, given up some of that this week. But if it continues, if folks think Solana has maybe reemerged like the Phoenix from the wake of FTX, then perhaps it might be worth discussing bringing it back on the show in a more in-depth capacity. Right now, though, giving off about almost two and a half bucks on the week, so not a great week. For Solana XRP having a decent week this week, though, 37 and a half cents last week, 46.8 cents this week's up a little over nine cents on the week. So XRP having a nice lift. Are we finally maybe starting to see the storm clouds lifting out there? Who knows? We've been saying that for so long. I don't even want to invoke that and put that out into the ether anymore. Listeners we will know when we know with XRP. (laughs) I don't think it will be subtle when we finally find out one way or the other what's happening out there. A uh, Dogecoin 7.1 cents last week, a whopping 7.25 cents this week. So a big banger out there. Litecoin 80 and a half cents last week, 88.70 this week. So doing a little bit of an inverse Solana up eight and a quarter points this week. So quite a pop out there. Cardano 33.6 cents last week, 34.3. So not a huge move out there. A uh, polka dot six and a quarter last week, 585 this week. So giving off around 37 odd cents on the week. And everyone's favorite, the Shiba Lambos, 0.00001 last week and still hanging out, 0.00001 this week. All right, that is going to do it for us here on the Crypto Rundown this week. I want to thank our guest, Stuart Popejoy from Kadena out there. Check them out. Kadena.io is their website. It's also their handle. Over there on Twitter, Kadena underscore IO, place to go to learn more about everything they have cooking up there on their blockchain. Sounds like a lot of fascinating stuff, eliminating some of the traditional barriers to entry. You don't need to be a coder to be able to take advantage of some of that stuff now. So that's always fascinating. What do you think, listeners? Have you maybe soured a little bit on blockchain? Was the hype so intense in the beginning that now inevitably you kind of turned a little bit on it? Or maybe do you think there's still some promise out there? And maybe like Stuart was saying, it's time to 
change the discussion, alter the narrative a little bit away from some of those early expectations towards things that are a little bit more feasible and a little bit more solvable with blockchain. An intriguing discussion. Either way, I look forward to hearing from you folks. That's all you're going to hear from us today on the network listeners. Uh, back again tomorrow. Looks like we're going to have a pro Q&A as well as the advisors option coming at you tomorrow. So all you live folks have a chance to tune in for that fun. Wednesday, a double bonus. You're getting two episodes of Options Boot Camp for all you pro folks out there. You'll get it live on the live feed, of course, on the old the pro podcast feed. Going to be joined by our buddy, Mr. Overby, out there as well. So going to have a little bit of double educational whammy going for you on Wednesday. Should be fun. Back again on Thursday, of course, with the Option Blog episode two, as well as this week in Futures Options. Very much the sister program for this one. You should be checking that out if you're listening to the Crypto Rundown. Friday, Volatility Views. And for all you pro folks, back again with Options Oddities. And we're back again next Monday, another episode of the Crypto Rundown. Stay safe out there, everyone. Crypto Rundown is brought to you by Amber Data. If you're entering the digital asset class, you'll need access to granular on-chain and market data from multiple venues to power research, trading, risk management, and compliance. Amber Data delivers comprehensive data and insights into blockchain networks, crypto markets, and decentralized finance, empowering financial institutions to apply traditional finance methods to digital assets. Amber Data eliminates the infrastructure setup, integration challenges, and maintenance headaches to access digital asset data, reducing cost and time to market to enter the digital asset class. Learn more and download their digital asset data guide at www.amberdata.io. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com.